Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm here tonight with uh, City Councilor Victoria Pelletier and a special guest, City Councilor Regina Phillips is uh, standing in for Roberta Rodriguez tonight. So we're very, very pleased to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching in from home. Uh, we have some more person on the street interviews to share with you today and hear what your counselors have to say about the issues that are raised. We're going to do a little check in first. Uh, coming to you from the Portland Media Center. Um, let's find out how your week was. You kind of had a day, I know, Councillor Pelletier. How mm -hmm. about your week? Yeah, we what had a that? week. Yeah, and it feels like it was so long ago. And it was Monday, but we had our, our meeting on Monday. Um, and everybody knows this by now, I think, but we got Zoom bombed, um, which has been happening pretty much since February, but this was probably one of the worst it's ever been. So sorry. Where, yeah, like, you know, people called in with super racist and um, homophobic and transphobic and anti-Semitic comments consistently on pretty much every item, not even just like public comment on non-agenda, but on every item using fake names and just really trying uh, to disrupt the meeting. And it was hard for... A lot of us who have been dealing with that personally, even uh, uh, being, you know, counselors of color. Mm -hmm. And we suspended the meeting midway, pro probably midway through, um, which we've never done before, to go into executive session because we just couldn't proceed. It just wasn't working um, for us to get anything done. So I think we're, we're now looking at revisiting the... Um, remote public participation policy and seeing what we can do so that people can still give public comment, but maybe aren't uh, able to do so on Zoom because on Zoom you can be very anonymous. And so we're looking at what the requirements would be if we got rid of that option and just asked people to come in if they had a comment. Um, so we're going to look at that. Right, exactly, the way it used to be. So, you know, the Zoom participation part was great because a lot of people can go home, make dinner, listen to the meetings and call in. People that have to work still um, can call in from work if they step out. And, of course, people who are unable, physically unable to get into City Hall, it's great to have um, to make sure that they can still participate in the meetings. But we just need to figure out that balancing act that keeps us safe and productive, keeps everybody safe and productive, um, and really wards off a lot of the calls that we're getting because it was just not constant it's on just Monday. Harassment. It's it is just harassment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. How did you uh, experience this, Regina? Was it horrifying or, you know, it's kind of become routine now? Or, I mean, how do you feel when it's happening? Oh, well, it's like uh, Tori said, I mean, we, we've been dealing with this. I've been dealing with this ever since I've been on the council. Okay. Right? I got, um, I was sworn in in, De and in December. January was my first council meeting. And so literally, I think we've been mm -hmm. dealing with this since January, mm -hmm. either January or February. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's just sad. It's sad that we have to, we have to go. We have to listen to it. Right. Um, we go back and forth and, you know, we're told, oh, that's uh, freedom of speech. And then, um, but the freedom of speech, uh, is hate speech. Mm -hmm. So it's really complicated because we're like, we don't want to listen to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, it's upsetting to listen to. Um, our, you know, concentration um, is not all there because we're listening to, you know, folks call in and being, and being racist and sharing things and saying really inappropriate things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to listen to because, again, um, it messes with our concentration. We're there to do a job, um, and we want to do that job, and we want to hear public comment, um, but it's hard when somebody keeps calling in and, you know, mm. using um, derogatory terms and names and all Sometimes that Sometimes they call the counselors out by name, too. I yeah, believe, they do. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you would share my interpretation. My interpretation of it is they're trying to harass counselors of color or possibly counselors that are Jewish or possibly counselors that are LGBTQ. They're trying to harass y'all into not serving anymore, of just going like, I don't need the high blood pressure, I don't mm -hmm. need the headache, I don't need the, you know, a public service serving as a city counselor is a hard task, mm -hmm. what little remuneration you get for it would barely, I, I'm sure you don't ever figure out how much per hour <laughs> you make for the work that you put in. I think it's like one penny. One penny, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the long those lines. So do you feel that this is an attempt to harass people of color off the city council, or is it just very immature, childish behavior that will, you know... 
Um, I mean, the thing that we have noticed is that this is happening in a lot of cities and towns in Maine. Mm -hmm. So Portland probably is the one that has it the most significant and at least the longest. But I think recently in the paper it was saying it was happening in other places as well, like Howell and Bangor and other cities. And so like places are getting Zoom bombed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a combination of the two. I think like there's joy and excitement for people to think that they've disrupted a meeting. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, I don't know that it's as much of like, don't run again. I just think it's more like we see diversity and we see, you know, this body working towards inclusionary practices, especially I think in Portland, because we are, I would say, out of the places that have been Zoom bombed, probably the most diverse and progressive city out of this. So I think people are just naturally looking at us as a target and saying, let's call in. I mean, a lot of these people don't even live in Portland. They're just calling in because it's something to do to call in anonymously and use a fake name and then try and just like call the counselors out um, with really racist and derogatory language. So Super cowardly. Um, like, I'm sure you yeah. don't really want them to come right in your face, physically confront you and say those things. But, you know, that's it does not take much courage to hide behind an assumed right. name and be on your computer somewhere people can't find you mm -hmm. and yep. talk trash like that. Right. That is right. Well, a lot of it, I mean, harassment and abuse is about power. Right. And so they're trying to gain some power over us, you know, like like we're going to go away or like, you know, yeah. whatever. And so it's like, you know, I don't necessarily know if it's it's, you know, not to let us run again. Um, but it definitely is something that, again, you know, I think they're um, doing it deliberately. I think they're trying to get us off our game. Um, and I think they're trying to instill power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because then they get to have power over our meeting. Mm -hmm. They get to control the meeting uh, and we don't. And um, and so I, I think it's, you know, it's to me, it's like a white supremacy culture. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you have power. There's power and there's white privilege and there's all of those things. And I think that that's what's happening. Well, luckily, you guys have the institutional power to say we're not doing Zoom comments mm -hmm. anymore mm -hmm. would be one right. uh, possibility or a city employee will vet the Zoom comments before mm -hmm. they reach the ears of the council and the public listening in. Yep. I, I read in the paper that it made Mayor Snyder cry eventually mm -hmm. after hearing so much hateful yeah. talk. Yeah, I think it's hard for her because, you know, we're 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 not sitting at the dais, right? We're sitting we're sitting around and and you know, we're like, Oh, we just don't want to hear this and for her she just doesn't know when to cut it off. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. You don't know what somebody's gonna say. Mm -hmm. You know, she's looking at our our uh, corporation council and they're saying it's free speech and so it's really hard and she's the one that has to decide um, when to cut it off and she also has to figure out who gets to go next and that kind of thing. And people change their name. As yeah. the story said, they change their name. Right. And so we have folks calling in and saying they're Bill Clinton and they're Jesse Ventura and also using inappropriate names. Mm -hmm. um, and she has to introduce that. And so that's really, that's really hard. Yeah, we don't see the names. So we, yeah. so we can't see who's coming next. No, you often can't tell that until you say it out loud. Yeah, I mean, yeah, once I, the names I, are said out loud, school, yeah, so one, yeah, we all have an idea once the name is said out loud, and especially because for the meetings, we, we normally get the same callers every time. So we've gotten familiar with the names and you can tell because you were supposed to say your name and where you live and you can tell when the address isn't real or when, you know, there's hesitation of like where they live. So immediately when a name is said, we know it's not real, but we can't see the actual list. And I think that was part of the difficulty too, was she saw a list of names that were really horrible names. And so I think that that was just tough to, to be able to have to read those as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, my heart goes out to all of you and thank you for your service. I don't live yeah. in Portland, but I have many family members that do. And, you know, I really appreciate the Portland City Council and you should not have to put up with that. Thank you. Thank you. Your job. Appreciate that. Should we move on to some more uh, coherent and intelligent comments from the public? Yes, please. Uh, um, Warren Edgar and I went out into the street a couple weeks ago. We went to the Eastern prom and we went to uh, Deering Oaks and we were able to talk to some folks and ask them the very open-ended question. We have this TV show with city councilors. What are your issues that you would like them to either think about or questions you have for them or things you'd like them to consider? So let's roll the first one. To me, I think the most important thing right now for Portland is more affordable housing help more people who are living on the streets right now to have a place. So I think that would mean more housing first sites as well as more low income sites. 
So he's uh, identifying two, this, this person seemed to be fairly knowledgeable because he talks about housing first sites and he talks about low income uh, housing sites. Didn't the state just allocate some money to housing first in their last, the last, the legislature's last session, I believe some money mm. was earmarked for housing first programs, um, which is different from low income housing. Uh, Care to comment on either of those or both? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the legislature. Um, I know that um, <clears throat> we need all kinds of housing. <laughs> we need all kinds of housing. I would say the only kind, the housing that we don't need is housing that, you know, that rich people need, right? Because that's a diamond dozen. Anybody who can afford, you know, to live, you know, in Portland, we don't need that kind of housing. Yeah. Um, and not to say that they're not important and we don't want them to live in the city, but they can afford to, to live wherever they want to live. Um, and if they want to live in Portland, great. You know, you can afford, again, afford to go out and, and, and purchase something. Um, we need affordable housing. We need um, housing first. We need housing for folks who suffer from substance use disorder. We need more mental health beds. We need uh, affordable housing. We need workforce. We need any kind of housing that we can get. Um, because we have such a diverse city. Um, and so we need lots of housing. We have a lot of our refugee and immigrant communities that need, you know, four, five, six bedroom house, uh, apartments mm. um, and also affordable. So we need any kind of housing that we can get and we need any kind of housing from the state um, that, that they want to give in order for us to either build it or find it. Yeah, and I think to add, I mean, and I completely agree with low-income housing as well. We There is housing that's in the process of being created. It's just really slow moving. So the planning board just approved housing in Lambert Woods, I think it's called, which is like 160-something units. 25% of that will be affordable housing. Um, it's not as much as we would like, but that is going to be moving forward and was just approved by the planning board in the spring. And then there is um, the 800 unit development that's being talked about in Bayside. And all of that, I think, will be affordable housing. So that's still in the workshop phase in the planning uh, planning board. It hasn't been passed yet, but that's housing that would be potentially created. And so I really encourage individuals if they can go to those workshops to attend because a lot of information is happening there. So that's housing that's making a, a little bit of a movement. And then there is a building near City Hall, actually, that was a vacant building that's going to be turned into housing. And I think that's 100 units. I'm not sure how many how much of that will be affordable housing i do know it's studio it'll be studio apartments one and two bedroom apartments as well so there is housing that's being created but it's the supply and the like the supply is outweighing the demand entirely and so to the public and even to us on the council it moves it feels like it's moving extremely slow so i very much understand what this person is saying about the lack of affordable housing um and the fact that it we are moving as quickly, I think, as we can based on the fact that we have, I think, such a different city than we had even five or 10 years ago. And, and people who really need places to live um, and the fact that like we're moving as fast as we can, but we just don't have enough supply to meet the necessary demands. And I also think um, in terms of housing first, I mean, the. The encampment crisis response team is their model is really housing first as well. So I know he had mentioned getting people off of the streets and into housing. Right now, it's more getting people off of the streets and into shelter, mm -hmm. um, which they're trying to do as well. And we, we get updates all of the time from that committee. But it's we're consistently trying to work in order to get people out of encampments and get them into shelter and then talk about transitional housing options. So it is slow and we're really trying our best. And I encourage Everyone, I think I said this last time, too, to join the committee meetings, because even in like the HEDC committee meetings, I get it. They're not so exciting. And even HHS, they can be really boring. But I think that's where the conversations also happen about like what's happening with housing. We probably get updates in terms of like the Bayside development, the Lambert Woods development. And then people can start to understand like housing is, is being created. Mm -hmm. We're looking at vacant buildings that we're hopefully able to turn into housing. It's just going to take some significant time. Right. And it's not happening just in the city of Portland. No, it's right. happening. It's not unique across to the nation, right? In every city, oh. but it sounds like Portland has more solutions in the pipeline than people may realize. Too. Right. Yeah.
Yeah. Should we go on to our next? We've talked about housing so much, and we will continue to talk about housing a lot because it is a crisis. But um, our next um, interview was a completely different topic that we haven't yeah. brought up before. Um, I would love if we could discuss a more collaborative effort towards addressing food security. Um, working with Maine Snap Ed, um, we are definitely taking an approach to talk about like education, um, and we're reaching folks in our community. And at least myself working in Portland, I know that there's a ton of other organizations like working towards this cause. I would love to see some collaboration, you know, so we can all kind of have a shared goal and maybe some some more guidance. So this is a woman who works for SNAP-Ed. She was at the farmer's market running mm -hmm. their booth. And um, you may know that SNAP-Ed goes into schools and tricks kids into eating Brussels sprouts and things like that. I've, I've been the teacher in the room. They're brilliant. They're so good at it. It really works. Um, but uh, I think that uh, they were concerned about partnering with uh, agencies or um, city mm -hmm. um, departments that address hunger and uh, a shortage of food. So um, I don't know a lot about what kind of partnerships exist or really, mm. I know what Preble Street does. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what else goes on in uh, Portland. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I know that um, that um, the legislation did pass. It was either last year or the year before that um, everybody was going to get free breakfast. Right, so um, kids are able to eat at school. I know that there's a lot of schools that also provide some food pantries. Um, and so, um, you know, that's at least getting, you know, the kids food. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can obviously take it home um, and that kind of thing. I think that um, there's a, I think there's the Good Food Shepherd. I think there's um, Cultivating Community. I think there's a lot of organizations, um, you know, that are trying to work really hard um, in order for us to have food security, but it's really hard and it's very difficult. And, and through the pandemic, we saw that the food cost, you know, is skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. It's just go try and find a, go try and buy a, a, a dozen of eggs. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the price doubled. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we want to work with anybody that's going to help people eat. That's, I mean, that's, you should, you shouldn't, you should not have to go without a meal. That's for sure. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that, too, really expanded throughout the pandemic. So organizations, like you said, Cultivating Community, Good Shepherd Food Bank, I know like Presente Maine, um, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, these organizations started to expand in terms of food delivery mm -hmm. and just delivering it to individuals who weren't able to leave their house, who couldn't leave their house. So I actually really like what she thought in terms of like partnering and more opportunities for food uh food insecurity to, to have those partnership opportunities because I don't know at the city level if we actually have outside of like our health and human services work mm -hmm. I don't know that we actually have one specific to combating food insecurity in Portland I think we have a lot of really great grassroots organizations that I just right. we both just listed that do that work but I don't know that we have a dedicated effort towards that at the city level so much um, and if we do I feel like it's not as robust as maybe it could be. So I actually really like that idea and I'm trying to ask you, as I was listening, I was trying to figure out like what committee that would lie in. I do think it would be likely in health and human services and public safety. And it brings me back to our goals, which were racial equity as well. And I think like that's a huge piece that oftentimes is missed in terms of talking about how we're gonna make sure that we are providing resources as necessary as possible. It actually expands beyond, I think what we have even thought of as for resources and it does expand into food. And I don't know that we've ever actually had that conversation um, at the city level. So I think that's something to actually look into, especially as we start figuring out what our goals are for the next year of the Health and Human Services Committee, because it's wild that we're at the end of the year. But when we think about our goals, I think that's something that I'll have to keep in mind in terms of saying, what are our options to do as a committee to make sure that we are partnering with a lot of these organizations that are working on food insecurity. So. Mm -hmm. That yeah, just gave me an idea, but right. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing, because uh, you raised a good point, which is just during the pandemic, um, uh, folks who were, were receiving food stamps were able to get more food stamps. And now that the pandemic is over, <laughs> um, all of those benefits are going to be taken away. And so it's really important for us to take a look at that at this point in time, because mm -hmm. somebody who may have been getting an extra $100 a month for food um, because of the food prices are so high, they are not going to get that now. Um, and so it is really important for us to, uh, and something that we really need to take a look at. It's tricky when it intersects with housing, too, because right. you can't get yeah. uh, SNAP food stamps if you don't have a place to cook. And mm -hmm. if you're living in a tent, I don't think they would consider that. Uh, right. an, you know, they would not accept that as, yes, I have a place to cook. Right. So. That's right. 
Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we are going to go on to our next um, topic, and I think that this one is just a visual. Uh, we uh, this was a. Um, a underage person that wanted to talk to us. And so I'm going to read their words. Uh, and I think that uh, Warren's going to show them on the screen so people at home can follow along. So this was a Portland seventh grader who said to us, I used to go to a school in Portland and we would have to be worried about where we were walking because we would have to be cautious of stepping on needles. I've almost stepped on a needle like 16 times. It's scary. Mm from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, thank you to the seventh grader that engaged with us. I really appreciate it. And I also um, agree that it's it's scary and it's a really big concern. I think right now we have 14 Sharps containers throughout the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. um, in my district, in the Deering Oaks area, we have a probably Deering Oaks and kind of Parkside area, probably two, I think. Um, and I think we're, we're always having conversations about expanding that. I think initially 14 seemed like a decent amount. Mm -hmm. But this past couple years where we've just seen such an increase of substance use, we've seen an increase of needing more resources for our unhoused neighbors, that number I think really needs to be doubled. And I'm hoping that we can end up getting there because I, I agree that, you know, there are places where you walk and there are um you know, needles on the ground, and that's obviously not safe for anyone, and especially for kids that are walking to and from school. So I, you know, the Health and Human Services um, and Public Safety Committee is very aware of the need for resources like this so that we can have easy access sharps containers everywhere. I know some of them are around the public restrooms, and I think we're just now seeing how much need we have for more resources like this. So I, again, like I said, I'm hopeful that we can put some more um, out and about throughout the city. And this is just also a plug that we have C-Click Fix, and our public works department is extremely fast at going to get sharps um, and, and disposing them, of them properly. I saw so, a question come up on Reddit about that. People okay. saying, you see click fix. And yeah. Somebody said, but it's in my driveway. That's private property. Will the city respond? I don't know what the answer to that is. I think they'll still respond. They yeah. still would, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a public health it's, Yeah. And, you know, nobody wants to just have a, just because it's your private property and there happens to be a needle there. I would, I think city staff would still come and dispose of it. And like I said, they're, they're really quick with that, of course, okay, because it is, a, is a, it is a hazard. Um, and despite being understaffed, they really make sure that it's a priority to continue to monitor that. So that's a really easy way to take a picture of it, send it in, don't touch it. And hopefully, you know, within, I would say, like an hour, a half hour, someone will be there to, to pick it up and dispose of it. But I, I very much agree with that student. And I think we're going to do what we can to really expand the, the Sharps containers that we have around the city because 14 based on, I think, mm -hmm. the significant amount of unhoused individuals and individuals just dealing with substance use in the city, we, I think, need to, to double, if not triple that, just so that there is no option for leaving it on the ground. Yeah, I, this is on all of our minds, right? And, I mean, this is huge. I mean, it, it's it's something that is on, I think, each and every city councilor's mind um, is how that we can um, work um, to eliminate this. Um, I think this is one way. I, I think we're always open to other ideas of what we can do um, to make sure that everybody's safe and that they're not, this poor seventh grader <laughs> yeah. is not walking and seeing the needles. Um, and so... Uh, we're open to any suggestions that anybody has on how to figure out how to diminish that. But that, you know, that is definitely on the minds um, of all of us and how we can make our parks a little bit Are there any needle exchange programs in mm -hmm. Portland? Yeah, we have a needle exchange oh, program. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, which is great. And I think, too, with something like this, it's tough because we, like, in the short term, sharps containers, of course, but like this, I think, is such a larger conversation around right. substance right. use and around right. the impacts, the lack of resources that we have. Um, and so this is a symptom, I think, of a bigger issue and a bigger conversation that I hope we can have around what does, so what do safe injection sites look like in the city of Portland? That's That was one of our goals in Health and Human Services and Public Safety mm -hmm. because of just such a need and a demand for handling the encampments this summer. It just wasn't right. something that we could get to, but that's that was on all of our minds. And we talked to city staff about that who you know in the past I think that that's been considered so what does that look like for the city how would we be able to do something like that so that we can make sure that we are 
being partners to individuals that are dealing with substance use and making sure that we're not just saying like sharps containers and and like that's kind of it like that's just a, a small mm -hmm. i think solution in the interim but i'm i'm hopeful that we can have bigger conversations around what substance use looks like in the city of portland because it's going to happen it's always going to happen um and i just want to make sure that we can expand our options like like regina said um forward yeah i'm glad you said that because really the sharps containers are for the seventh graders or the exactly. general public yeah the substance use disorder sufferers need many many things right. sharps right. container is kind yeah. of the least of it but yeah. great um okay let's roll our next comment here be nice to make things more affordable in portland it's gotten really expensive um over the last uh 10 years i've been here 20 years and i've seen the price of rent double and triple so that'd be nice um but I know that's supply and demand. So city councilors, I mean, it's on you to make this city affordable. Like yeah. all the other cities aren't affordable, but let's make Portland affordable. No, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding a little bit. We've already talked about food costs. We've talked about housing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the affordability issues that could be addressed? Is it parking? Is it uh, um, public transportation being affordable? What, I mean, what are some other areas of affordability? Well, are they, sorry, are they talking yeah. about how, because I was just going to say short-term rentals for me as a renter, or what's driving up the rent, at least for where I live. So and Airbnbs. I think, yeah, Airbnbs yeah. and short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. I think we, we have... I feel like I, I feel like I say this every meeting because I get into I'm like the resident like renter on the council and I'm like it's short term rentals let's talk about it because they are driving my rent up where I can barely afford to be a counselor in the city so it is a constant thing that we need to chip away at um, because our city is overrun with short term rentals where you become like a popular foodie city everybody wants to come see us which is great but we have so many non owner owner occupied Airbnbs mm. that are just existing and they're operating like illegal hotels in neighborhoods mm. and so like you can walk a couple of blocks and these are just empty condos or empty apartments that are catering to tourists to come visit us. And then it's driving up the property value for the rest of us that actually live in that neighborhood. So I think attacking the short term rentals, um, which I know has been an on and off again conversation with the council, would go a long way to, I think, stabilizing some of our rent in Portland mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that, again, the people that, that live here and that do rent here have a fighting chance to continue to live here and to continue to rent here. So that is yeah, that rent. I mean, we have rent control, right? I mean, yeah. it's passed, right? We have rent, rent control. So we are trying to make sure that the rent doesn't go up astronomically, right? And so right. at this point in time, you know, the rent c control ordinances is you can't raise the rent more than 10% in the city. Mm -hmm. Now, it, the unfortunate thing is, is when you come into the city, you have to find, you know, one bedroom or a two bedroom. It's going to cost you 1500 to $2,000. Um, but we are trying to curve that by by saying that we have rent control um, and making making landlords more responsible, um, mm -hmm. you know, in order to make the rent affordable. Um, but again, affordable housing, um, we need more affordable housing. And, you know, we don't have the land. Portland doesn't have the land, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to just all of a sudden build. And so by looking at some abandoned properties and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, we also haven't talked about um, we haven't talked about vouchers. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we have folks staying in an encampment um, and we need affordable housing, but we also need vouchers. There's none available. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's just a vicious cycle mm -hmm. um, of you go down one route and there's a block and you have to turn around and go on another road. And then there's another block, um, especially where housing is concerned. But Victoria has the solution and it is get rid of these short term rentals that I'm are waiting for us to do using it. up housing stock <laughs> and not housing much of anybody other than. Yeah tourists who could once upon a time would have stayed in a hotel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, believe it or not, our time is almost up. So uh, it's been the usual housing, housing, food, housing, mm -hmm. needles, housing, yeah. affordability. But as we all know, the housing crisis is uh, with us and um, it's not going away. And I uh, really respect the work that both of you do to address the issue. You know, you're not, you can't do magic, but you can uh, try your best and mm -hmm. use your intelligence and cooperation to solve these problems. Hey, thanks for being with us, everybody. Uh, we're going to say goodbye. We're here at Portland Media Center, which we thank very much for hosting our show every month. Next month is Friday the 13th, October 13th. We will be doing an election, pre-election show, where we kind of go through the ballot and talk about um, the initiatives that are on there so to help give voters a better idea of what they're going to be uh, looking at when they walk in. I'm Lisa Savage saying thanks for being with us and uh, be well.